Good afternoon, Turks and Caicos. And it is a beautiful Thursday here in Providenciales. And of course, across the Turks and Caicos Islands, we want to wish each and every one of you guys um, a happy Easter, beginning with uh, Good Friday tomorrow. I hope you guys have a wonderful, restful, safe, and peaceful holiday, man. You know, and um, don't just uh, sit back and relax on the holiday. Go out and do something together as a family. Do something to, uh, for those of you that may be Christians or that may be religious, do something to remember the life and death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And that's what Easter is all about. But today, it's not about Easter. It's about the Patriot Hour. And you're listening to another episode live via Tropical Vibes 105.5, 103.5 FM. And of course, live on Ustream. That's www.ustream.tv forward slash channel forward slash vibes 105 FM. And there you have it. Okay? Live via radio. And today we will be talking with a very special, special young lady. Um, she's no stranger to the TCI, and of course, she's no stranger to, to radio and to media as a whole. Um, a very prolific leader here in the Turks and Caicos Islands, doing her thing and her own uh, area of expertise, uh, or so uh, Miles Monroe may say, our own area of gifting. And, you know, I'm going to let her tell you a little bit about herself for those of you that may not know her. I seriously doubt there's anyone that don't, but uh, introduce yourself to our listeners out there today. Well, thank you, Damien, and hello, Turks and Caicos. Uh, my name is Sonia Bienemy, formerly Sonia Fulford, as most of my Grand Turk people and schoolmates may know me as. Um, I'm the president here of the Turks and Caicos Islands Football Association. Originated from Grand Turk, but developed sports in all of the islands in the Turks and Caicos. Um, I'm also, in football, I'm also the executive committee of FIFA and um, CONCACAF and an advocate for the development of women's football and empowerment of women through not only throughout our region but throughout the world. Oh, thank you. And you see, so that there you have it, guys. Now, Sonia, I'm going to jump right into it, right? You, you said you're an advocate for, for sports, for women for women in sports, and today we're, we're not going to be just talking about women, but we're going to be talking about sports in general, you know, and, and how sports can contribute to the national agenda. And so first off, I want to ask you, you know, what are some of the benefits of sports for those who, who may not be athletic or may not, you know, do much in that area? What are the benefits, you know, personally, professionally, what are the benefits of sports? Well, Damon, you know, I'm, I'm glad at the outset you said that we're not just gonna talk about women in sports or the development of women. And I'm happy you said that because most times when um, people see a woman in position, mm -hmm. um, especially on an executive committee at, you know, where the larger percentage is made up of men, mm -hmm. they originally, they, they, at the outset, they think that that female um, is there as a voice for women and women only. Mm -hmm. But my role in football and my role in sport, even though I'm a female and I am an advocate for women, women's development, um, it doesn't stop there. It's not, you know, I'm, I'm, I work in the development of football for men, women, boys, girls, um, for everybody. everybody. So, you know, I'm happy you said that. But benefits that sports can offer, geez, I mean... The, the, the benefits are countless. Um, there's the social benefits and the economic benefits. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, the things that um, I think in the most simplest benefit of all that we can all get from participating in sport or even organizing sports as such is meeting people, networking. And um, I'm sure, as you know, um, there, there, there are major benefits from networking. You meet some of the most important persons throughout the world and you know learning never stops um, it's ongoing you can never know too much um, and I firmly believe e that exactly um, from an economic standpoint we have you know right here in the Turks and Caicos Islands um, you with hosting events um, putting on events and everything you know the, the hotels benefit from it in terms of you know their rooms and boarding we have the taxi drivers um, the restaurant 
So it is definitely something that our country can benefit from economically. Um, and it's also the health and, and education aspect of it. Um, sports help you to lead a healthier lifestyle. So um, there you have it. Um, the, the benefits okay. are so, endless. So the benefits of sports, are, as you said, are endless. It's numerous. Yes. You know, and, and we're going to look at those benefits in conjunction with um, nation building, you know, forming the national agenda. And in relation to that, what would you say is the current state of sport in the TCI? You know, are we better off than we were 20, 30, 40 years ago? It's, it's fair to say we are, absolutely. Uh, but what I admire about back then that I think is kind of missing now is that being a, an athlete, you know, back 10, 15, 20 years ago, um, athletes, they were more dedicated and committed when you look at the mm -hmm. grand scheme of things. Um, they, I th thought they wanted it more. And what those athletes were missing was there was, you know, less resources. And I think if we had some of the resources that we have now, then, you know, we would have had, you, um, they would have been more successful. But what we have now that didn't exist then is we have a number of um, national governing bodies, mm -hmm. um, the, the federations, the organizations responsible for the development of sports here in the Turks and Caicos Islands. And I think that helps a lot. Um, because you have these national bodies that can, um, that are responsible for the development of sport in their specific area. So focus, you know, they, they can focus on, on that athlete in that specific sport discipline and, and they can help them much more. But, um, so you're, what you're saying is that we're able to get more specialized training and attention. We, we can, but we can, but there, there is still a little downside. You know, we have a far way to go still. We're, we've already moved leaps and bounds um, from 20 years ago, mm -hmm. but we have, a, we have a far way to go because even in terms of the member associations, we have a few that are probably well-structured and, you know, they, they have the programs that, mm -hmm. that can assist the athletes from the grassroots up to probably semi-professional. And, and they're geared towards that, you know, development stage. But, and then again, there are those that want to, but they don't have the, the proper structure. So because of their limit resources, their limited resources, um, they can't do much for development. And then there are that few that are just existing. So. Okay, yeah. now, now I, I, want, I want to touch on those that, that, that actually have, a, you know, that exist, mm -hmm. but doesn't have that proper structure and may have limited resources. Do you, it, is the reason for that, um, the limited resources, that they don't have that proper structure, or it, is it th they're not getting enough attention from um, the, the overarching bodies? Well, um, that can be as a result of many factors. And um, I think that every member association here, even the ones that are properly structured, mm -hmm. and Turks and Caicos Football Association is one of them that are properly structured, um, there are still very limited resources. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's depending on the national association. So we're going to go to the middle now. Um, and that, you know, they're, they're probably limited because of a number of different factors. Um, I think that most of the member associations here, I'm not sure how much, but I know a lot of them, they, um, there is an opportunity to get financial assistance and um, other resources, for example, educational training and that kind of thing from their parent body. But like the football association, you have to, um, there are certain guidelines and requirements that you have to fulfill in order to be able to access that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, membership fees and um, some some um, bodies even ask that you participate in a certain number of competitions or games um, mm -hmm. per year or within their cycle. There are different regulations depending on you know the organization and. Um, you know, so I, I, I don't know why um, some are still in that situation, mm -hmm. but 
um, there are other um, organizations that you can tap into to ask for assistance on how do you go about certain things if you, you know, if you if you're not sure. And and I'm for sh I'm one of those organizations that, you know, we've always uh, made ourselves available um, for, you know, people to come and get assistance if they need to know how to um, better structure their association. Okay. Now, can I ask, do, do you think, um, just from the fact that the associations, some of them may need more structuring, some of them may need more assistance in terms of the, the, the economic aspect of it, you know, in some order to... Some just need to do something, period. Well, we, we definitely know that. Yeah. Um, do you think then that is where the government in the Sports Commission uh, can play a bigger role in terms of how they, they set um, national policies for sports and so forth? Um, the government is a very important factor in all of this. And because I don't care how, how um, good or, you know, an, uh, an organization is operated, I don't care how professional your organization is, how well you do things, mm -hmm. um, you're still not going to get maximum results unless um, there's a partnership with the government. And the government has a major role to play in all of this in, in, in assisting these um, organizations with getting more structured or even getting up to par. They can even, you know, assist financially or in, mm -hmm. in other resources. So um, do, you, do you believe that importance is being placed on sports as, uh, as a national, uh, as an instrument of nation building, or do you think we're still looking at it from the point of recreation? Or can, can, do, do athletes see it as a career path? I, again, um, We'll have to, to judge this on an individual basis. I, I understand because, you can't speak yes, for every, yeah. every sporting I'll, body. I'll say, um, um, let's talk about the athletes first. Um, let's look at Delano Williams um, mm -hmm. and Billy Forbes, mm -hmm. who play semi-professional play, yeah, soccer. In um, the U.S. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, both of them are very young men. Um, their career has started from an early age. Mm -hmm. They're very dedicated. They're committed. Um, I believe they really know what they want. And both of them have excelled on the limited mm -hmm. resources that we have. And I, I honestly believe if, if they weren't that dedicated or committed or they themselves didn't really want it, they wouldn't be headed on the path that they are now. Mm -hmm. um, and, and both of them, um, you can see that that is their career path. It's paying part. off. That yeah. is their career path. Then again, we have the athletes who are very good, um, but they're motivated by the competitions during the event um, or the sports meet and the fact that they're standing on the podium and getting the medals and all of that. They're motivated. This is their best day. They perform very well during the event itself. After the event, um, they go back to their normal life where they don't train or anything and they get excited so at the a, next event. So there's a lack of commitment there, in, there, in there. There is a lack of commitment. There is a, um, a lack of commitment from the athlete, but um, I think the fact that the, the resources mm -hmm. from um, the national governing bodies, from the government who um, should be playing a major role in all of this, is lacking. Mm -hmm. um, there is also that lack of motivation mm -hmm. for some of the athletes because everybody don't have the same drive. Mm -hmm. Some may need a l you're thinking some may need a little a little more push to some have that need, commitment. Yes, a lot may need a, a little more push because if you if you don't have the proper facilities to train or if you don't have um, a coach um, who you know who is. Um, qualified or experienced to, to push you or to train you in that specific discipline. Not every athlete knows how to do that on their own. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, not every athlete will find that drive on their own. So there must be, you know, some push, you know, some assistance from the government and the national governing bodies to help those athletes along. 
Now, we, we're, we're talking about the government giving assistance in, in terms of building a better structure. Because we know TCI, in terms of sports overall, has a pretty loose structure. You know, yes. I, and, and I do understand that it's a lack of human resources, finances, a lot of different things, right? Mm -hmm. But would you say we need a more robust, year-round type of training programs um, for, sport, for the various different um, disciplines? and probably making it more structured sports Absolutely. in our secondary schools. You Absolutely. Know. Absolutely. That's where it starts. As a matter of fact, um, the, ro the robust training should start in that section in between grassroots and getting up to the secondary level. Mm -hmm. Because I think once you pass 13 years old, um, it's so hard to, to discipline an athlete or to get that athlete in the frame of mind after that. Because I, I was reading somewhere, I mean, not to, to, to break your train of thought, but mm -hmm. I was reading somewhere it takes 10,000 hours of training on average to get to the Olympics. So there you have it. <laughs> so what does that mean? We're not going to get there? <laughs> so so I, I'm just thinking, you know, no, with, and, and, and that is a serious on commitment. A serious, on a serious note, yes, it is a very serious commitment. And, and it's a commitment that, you know, it, it, we, it's a commitment that sh should come from everyone. Mm -hmm. You know, not only the athletes themselves. It should come from us as a national governing body because... This is why we're here. Mm -hmm. We're here to develop sport in that specific area. And I think as a national governing body, we need to do all that we can do until we can't do any more. And I don't see that. I don't, I don't see that. I see that from maybe about three or four a few. Mm -hmm. national governing bodies, and you, you really don't see that. So hats off to those athletes who can pull it out of their socks and do it on their own. Because most of them are basically doing it on their own. Yeah, do you think, uh, I mean, in terms, again, getting back to the athlete, and I don't want to, you know, um, knock on the athletes, because I know it, it, it's, it's, this is a multifaceted issue. Exactly. And, but I, I always say, um, you know, our kids today don't realize some of the opportunities they have because the, those that came before them didn't have access to the same opportunities. Right. So now we have, we have that, the doors open you know, well, slightly, well, yes, crack. slightly. It, yeah, it's, it's cracked, cracked open. So we, we, More than it was. we, we have the ability to, to squeeze in there and, you know, yeah. on occasions they're not taking advantage of that. And I, I'm just wondering, do you think uh, that the parents themselves need to play a greater role in, under, in, in getting the athletes to understand the opportunities that's, they have? May, uh, you know, because I always wonder, is it where the parents may not actually understand the opportunity that their child or, or that that ward that has been placed in, in their supervision, you know, the opportunity they have to make it farther in life. Absolutely. I mean, it's an education, educational process. Um, we often have meetings with our parents mm -hmm. um, to try to get them to understand, to know about the opportunities. I'll give you an example because, um, okay, you know, in football we have a very stringent um, eligibility rule. It comes from FIFA. Um, we unfortunately, I mean, we have children that come into our program from five years old, very committed. Most of them are not from here. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of expat children. There are children that were born here to expat parents, but because of our immigration laws, you know, they're, they're not entitled to Turks and Caicos citizenship until they reach, reach a certain, certain age. age. Mm -hmm. And, um, when it's time for the selection phase for national teams, there you have it. Most of these children whose parents have been living here forever, and um, they meet the requirements. They have Turks and Caicos passports. They make the team. And then there's that Turks and Caicos parent who their child may have been in our program, you know, and came out to a few sessions, not really committed. And I'm saying this because I'm, I'm going to talk about ourselves because mm -hmm. I mean, we no, we, we have to deal yes, with with, we, we with our own with our first. Problem. I always yes. believe that. And um, you select a team; they haven't been committed, um, and they didn't come out to meetings or anything, even to get mm -hmm. an update on what's going on or how you know what we can offer, how we can help you. And um, 
the selection list is out and they have the most to say about the makeup of the team. Mm -hmm. Mind you, while they're all Trucks and Caicos Islanders, regardless of how they met the requirements, but they are Trucks and Caicos Islanders, it's just that they weren't born here. You see, so it, and it, they have so much to talk about it. But, and I say that to say this, that we need to be involved in our children's um, life and their development and pushing them from the very beginning. We can't just jump on board when something fails for us or we don't get what we want. And I think the children, they, they notice this because they pay attention. They, they, they know that, that we're not really pushing. So they're not really pushing. And, mm -hmm. and as a parent, you have, to, you have to sit your child down and let them know the importance of it. Most of, a, a lot of us can't afford scholarships for our children. Turks and Caicos is a very expensive place to live. Um, and especially if you're a single parent, even those with both parents in the home. Trust me, I know. And if, <laughs> yes, <laughs> if, know. You get a, if you get a scholarship, I mean, that's a luxury for most people. You mm. can get this through sport. So why aren't you more involved in your child life, pushing them to help them to get this opportunity that you probably wouldn't be able to afford. I mean, even even with, uh, and I'm going to take this from a personal perspective, mm -hmm. even with my son, my, my, my oldest son is 14 now. And I can remember when we were living in the UK um, mm -hmm. just two years ago, we had him going to a sports college for, um, we were there for about three years. So we mm -hmm. had him going to a sports college the last two years of the time we were there. Okay. And he was doing track and field, and he loved it. You know, he loved doing track and field. He loved going to the coaching, all of that. And then we come home to TCI, and there isn't that same program. For him part to continue. Exactly. Right. And so I tried to get him involved in other sport, you know, like basketball. And he's like, no, I, I don't want to play I basketball. Do I want to do track and field. You know, and... So it's been a challenge for me to even get him away from the video games. Like, I've banned him from video games for this entire month. <laughs> and, and that is <laughs> where know? our national governing bodies need to come into play. Well, he, well he's, he's, I, I sat him down recently, and I talked to him, and I asked him, I said, look, you, you're going to have to do a sport, any sport. It's going like to be me. your choice, but you're going to have to do a sport. <laughs> you, know? you sound very much like me. Oh, I yeah, I told him. I said, you can't sit in the house and just... Expect to get up on a Saturday morning, mm -hmm. um, do a few chores, and then play video games for the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. I say, I understand you can't do track and field the way you would like it, but so what? Uh, you, so, you have since to. Since it's not there, or, you know, on that scale that you would like to do it, then you have to do, do something else. else. So I told him, I say, how about you pick what you want to do? And he said he wants to do football. So, um, so I told him, I said, look. After this term, after you finish your exams, mm -hmm. we're going to look into seeing if we could get you into the uh, local FA football mm -hmm. program, right? right? And so he says, okay, he'll do that. Right. And I told him, I said, once you start, you realize even if I have to drag you there myself, you're going to go. That's the attitude you, know? you have, and that's the attitude we should all have. And, and so th that's what I, I want to say to parents is that we, we have to take an active role in our child's lives, yes. whatever their interest may be, because even me as a child, I can remember my mother, she, I, I got a lot of whoopings for mm -hmm. destroying electronic equipment in the house. From an early age, I loved to open stuff. Right. And, you know, but after, she, after it came to a point where she realized it, that, hey, that this it, could be something great. Yeah, she realized that beating me wasn't going to solve anything. Mm hmm. So she just started buying stuff for and me to open. You. Yeah. Yes. And, and that's how I got into electronics, just by my mother, just, all right, I'll buy you an old TV and, or an iron and a radio and yeah, different and, things. And that's what we need to do. I've heard parents at times say, um, you know, important training sessions and telling the coach, well, oh, he didn't come out yesterday because he said he didn't feel like it. He was having a bad day. Mm. Or she didn't come out this morning because she overslept. You see, and, and that and, is and we can't no that 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 should not be an option. That is where we we we, the child themselves may not understand the opportunity they have, but the but parent right, has to understand exactly, the opportunity. Exactly. You know, and and now, I have another question. You know, mm -hmm. um, as it relates to the the economic side of things, you know, my mm -hmm. thinking is. 
if if we want to get some of those sporting bodies up to par, mm-hmm. I, I'm thinking, and I want your thoughts on this. Do you think it would be better for the government to say, "All right, let's pick"? And I don't know. Maybe they have. Mm-hmm. Maybe they have, and the, and and they haven't put the resources behind it. But right. do you think it would be better for them to say, "All right, let's pick those four core sports that we know are performing right now, that are mm-hmm. structured, that have athletes in programs, mm-hmm. and we have the possibility of making making this a career path." And then they put the resources behind, it and they tell these bodies, "Hey." Here's access to funding, access to this, and here's the requirements you have to meet. And they make it along the lines of whatever the governing, the world governing body mm-hmm. um, guidelines may be, you know. And then you told, and then you tell those other programs, okay, if you can get to this benchmark within a certain period of time, then you have access to this. Do you think it would be better if we if we went along those lines in terms of developing sport nationally? Yeah. Well, I. You know, the thinking behind it all would be to give every national governing body mm-hmm. support. And but I agree with that structure that you talk about because, you know, mm-hmm. I don't I don't always like to single member associations out because I'm the president of one and you know, even though I feel that we should get more backing from the government, I don't mm-hmm. like to talk about it because that's my member association. Mm-hmm. But I feel they should put support behind every member association because you know you're gonna have to get all of them structured if you want to make your job as a government easier mm-hmm. right um, otherwise you'll have people always knocking on your door I mean even if you're not giving those knocks are not gonna stop. so to make your job easier you need to give support to all of them but I I do think that for those that are properly structured and have programs, um, they can do it on a tier basis or however they want mm-hmm. to, you know, um, measure their contribution in terms of where you are. But I do think that those member associations that are already structured, already organized, have grassroots programs, youth development programs going all up to senior national mm-hmm. team programs. And you know that they do have legitimate development. They have um, athletes abroad on scholarships that you're not paying for. I think that special emphasis needs to be placed in well, those member associations because they can do much more with well, your that's, assistance. Well, that's, that's my thinking is yes. that those associations already have it going. All they may need is just a little push. And you can say, yes. hey, here's the benchmark for us as a government, okay? Yes. Here's a benchmark for us as a government. If you want our assistance, this is what we want from you. And, and that is what you do. And, and even if, and they should put funding behind it. Even if, of course, there will be um, requirements yeah, for these funding or whatever resources you put behind it. And there should also be an audit process to ensure that what your resources are being used mm-hmm. and, you know, in the way that it yeah intended yeah yes and Could, but but you can but you cannot just sit back and not support or wait until there is an event and that member association have to write to you for financial assistance and then the financial assistance is i mean you you probably the member associations i'm sure because we are grateful for whatever mm-hmm. assistance we get but it it sounds sound kind of ungrateful to say well you know Thanks for the assistance, but this can't really go anywhere. But in reality, no, that's I, what it is. I understand because um, let's say it takes thirteen hundred dollars for a child to get to a meet. Yes. That's one athlete, right? I'm telling and you. you need twenty athletes, or you have twenty athletes right. on the team. Um, I see where you're saying. You know, giving a thousand, or let's say giving five hundred dollars. Yeah may not You're happy be for sufficient. The You're happy, but... I, it you can't still, really get me anywhere. Yeah, it's still a headache to get the remaining funds. Yeah, and, and I have to use the Football Association as an example because, you know, I, that's, I know about the Football Association. And, um, you know, 
a lot of people, there's this misconception that, they, uh, well, when I say that we're the most organized member association, I have people from other um, national governing bodies saying to me, because you have a lot of money. That's why you're so organized, and that is not the reason why we're so organized. It's because of the way we do things and, and how we place our resources. But should, and should, should, should the fact that you have funding or you have some funding matter in terms of organization? It shouldn't matter at all, but then I guess some of us think that way. I mean, I understand it takes money to get things it, it, done. It does take but money. I'm just thinking from an organized structure point of view that you, money may not, necess organized, may not necessarily be no. needed. Organized, you don't need money to get your member association organized. You, have, you need money to do actual things within your organization to make things happen. Mm -hmm. When you talk about your meets, if you're talking about staff and that sort of thing. I mean, the football association gets $250,000 from FIFA every year. Of course, we have to meet requirements in order to get that. Mm -hmm. We're a member association. I mean, we've grown tremendously over the years, tremendously. Um, we now have about what? We have about four, four or five full-time staff, and we have part-time staff on all of the island because it is our goal to promote and develop soccer throughout the Turks and Caicos Islands. We have a program on North Caicos to facilitate North and Middle. We have one on South Caicos and we have one on Grand Turk. Mm -hmm. um, luckily for us, most of our volunteers, most of our, um, our assistance comes from volunteers. Mm -hmm. Now you think about it. We have a facility with two grass pitches. We have lights on both one we have. Our facilities are used every single day of the week because we have youth development programs every day except Sunday. Mm -hmm. We have games on those facilities at least four times a week, um, senior national team games, senior um, league games. And we have a beach soccer program that we run. You have staff, you have water, I'm you have light and all of that. Do you really believe $250,000 can do that? No. I'm th I, that's what I was about to say. I'm thinking just from uh, the maintenance of the The maintenance the alone, field the water is, 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 is going more than $4,000 $4, a month. So that's what I'm <laughs> thinking. It's going to cost yes. you sufficient to, to maintain yes. the field. We have to raise funds in order to subsidize the, the additional cost of our budget. Mm. And, and, of course, we do have some partners around the island, some very um, good sponsors who assist, but if they, they would like to do more. But they can because every single member association have to go to the same partners. The yeah, because it's it's just a very small business community. Yeah, so you know, this so. is where government has to come in, and they should not have to wait until the member association have an event to do that. We have international games. Um, whether we're inviting teams here mm -hmm. or we're sending teams abroad. We have at least 10 international games per year, the Football Association, youth and senior teams. To take a team from here just to Miami, you're looking at more than $30,000 to take a team. Ooh. And that is airfares alone. So just think about it. That, it it's a significant cost to yes. run the it sporting is a program. Yes. And, and I'm just thinking this is where, uh, this is where the actual parent may come in and say, you know what, I believe in my child's ability, I would like to see my child go farther, and, and they might actually pick up some of the funding, you know, yeah, just... If not the funding, they can, I mean, they can assist us in, in cutting the cost by just coming out and being a volunteer. Mm -hmm. And I like when I talk to the media because, you know, I, I, I need to let our parents know. Um, within our volunteer program, the, the smaller percentage comes from the, the local parents. Mm -hmm. the, the, the most of our volunteers are expats. Now, and I, I, I'm going to play devil's advocate here and if say If you're going to talk about the lack of experience... <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. I was going to say lack All of right. experience. <laughs> okay. I, I was going to say, let me play devil's advocate here. And, and thinking as, as a local parent, mm -hmm. a lot of parents, a lot of expatriate parents come from countries where there are structured programs where these things are done on a, on a regular basis and so they, they see the benefits around them. I'm thinking it may be difficult for a, a parent here 
to visualize the benefits unless we can paint that picture for them. Yes, and um, but for the mere fact that you're bringing your child out to sign up for this program, um, you shouldn't be bringing him just to sign up mm -hmm. for the exercise aspect of it or to say that I just want you doing something while I'm cleaning my house on a Saturday morning or through the week. Mm -hmm. When you bring your child out to sign them up for a specific sporting program, whether it's basketball, track and field, whatever it is, mm -hmm. your first thought process should be, what can I do to better this association so there'll be more benefits for my child? Okay. If you want to, because some parents are concerned, okay, my child is playing soccer like, after this what? Because okay. I know that's, that's the concern of most parents, sit down in with particular me with track and field. And you know. sit with me, and I'll explain to you the benefits. For instance, some of the benefits from soccer, of course, you can get a soccer scholarship. But every child that plays soccer isn't going to be, uh, or football, isn't going to be Lying a professional player. You're not even going to reach semi-professional. You may not even make the national team. But I'll use myself as an example. I'm not a professional player. I'm not even a player anymore. I'm an administrator. Mm -hmm. There are other opportunities. There's that of a referee, coaches, and these positions make a lot of medical money. Physicians, medical physicians. Medical physicians. Agents. There are a lot of managers. The, the I opportunities could go on and on. are endless. And, 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 of course, me and another parent were having this discussion. Their child played basketball plays basketball mm -hmm. I was telling them and they were talking about their child you know moving to the US because the opportunities are better mm -hmm. and I told them I said you know what I, I, I see where you're going in terms of facilities and access to different things yes the mm -hmm. opportunities are better but I tell them if we can get regular scouting programs in the TCI I it. think you have a far better chance of getting to the pros from a country like this rather than going into the U.S. Because I was speaking and to a friend a of mine. you have a chance of being selected. Yeah, because I was speaking <laughs> to a friend of mine and he was telling me, you know, he's a coach. And he was telling me that mm -hmm. it's only around 4% of high school players in the U.S. that actually even make it to collegiate level. Precisely. So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, when you think about that, the odds are really stacked against you. So, so. we're coming right back to our own soil. Yeah. The NGBs, the government, they need to work together to have structured programs, and it's so easy to have invitational meets and bring your scouts down. So, so can I ask you, on, on that basis, do you think that sport in general in the TCI can become a revenue-generating industry? Of course it can become a revenue-generating industry. I mean, the simple fact of hosting competitions. Okay, so... You, I, I mean, it, it, it may not be a major... Um, Revenue. Well, I'm I'm going to take but, I'm going to take one of our neighbors as an example, mm -hmm. or two of our neighbors, and, and and I know in various different disciplines, both Jamaica and the Bahamas have yes. invited us to be a part of various different meets and so right. forth. Right. Now they have significant. I'm not going to say huge, mm -hmm. uh, not as huge as the U.S. and those other countries, but they have significant uh, revenue generating um, sporting events. Right. Mm -hmm. Do you think the Turks and Caicos can get to, to that level where we're actually competing with them in terms of sports tourism? And, and, I, and I tell people all the time that what Usain Bolt has done, Usain Bolt and uh, Sherry, Shelly, Shelly Ann Frazier and all the other rest have done for Jamaica, mm -hmm. um, no amount of marketing on Jamaica's can part could have ever achieved that. You know, and so do you think the government here understands that if we put the money and investment in, we may not recoup the cost today, mm -hmm. but years down the road, because, I mean, Jamaica's athletics program didn't start yesterday. It started, I think, from the 1950s. If, oh. if anybody, if I'm wrong, you can call and correct right. me, okay? <laughs> but just from speaking to various different people, mm -hmm. I think they started from the 1950s, and, and it's paying off today. Okay, so you see how long they had to invest. It's, it's an investment. <laughs> it's, it's a long-term it's process. And it's not going to happen overnight. And, and we, have, we, 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 we can benefit from sports tourism here. And because, you know, sports tourism 
also have the potential to contribute to social and economic, um, cultural, and infrastructural development mm -hmm. in the country. Um, it's, it's, it's a huge investment. And, and it starts from, we're going to go right back because we're talking about the same thing over and over. It is so simple. It starts from, first of all, partnering and um, supporting your national governing bodies. You already have this base structure here mm -hmm. with these national governing bodies that are responsible for all these other difficult um, disciplines. Your job is halfway done because you don't have to create a department within your government to do all of this. Your job is halfway done. Invest in these people, partner with them, and let them do the work for you. Mandate it. Force them to do the work for you if you're making this investment. But we have to do I'm, it. I'm, I'm thinking, again, going back to my idea of having certain benchmarks and policy. Yeah. You say to them, this is a sports policy. Here are the benchmarks you have to meet in order to access this assistance, whether it's technical assistance, whether it's funding. Um, you know, you have to meet certain requirements. And, and that way, it's fair to everybody because they know when I approach the government, I have to meet a certain requirement. Exactly. It's, not, it's not based on the person's opinion. Ask, it's not based on yeah. how they feel. Right. I have to meet this requirement. It's not about asking and my political affiliation. Mm -hmm. is, this is what I need to do. Because I know if I don't do it, I'm not going to get it. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, I, I don't know if the government understands how much we can benefit from sports tourism, I really don't know. Um, because I don't see them investing in us in that mm -hmm. way. So, but it is something that they need to put on the table as a priority. And um, it's definitely going to reap the rewards. You'll not see it tomorrow. You may not see it the day after. But you're going to see it down the road. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I know we've talked a lot about the, the economic um, benefits of mm -hmm. it and so forth and, and, and the development benefits but what about the social aspect I mean sports has been used around the world to bring people together yes. I mean if you look at it in South Africa when Nelson Mandela came out he used the rugby team to bring South Africa together um, if you look at places like Sierra Leone yes. and other countries within Africa and Asia, they've used football, soccer, yeah. to, to basically yeah, bring people to together. Riots, mm -hmm. To riots, to do all of that. I mean, and s sports bring people to your shores, mm -hmm. not only to compete, but to watch, mm -hmm. you know. And this is where you get some of your best investors. So it... Just based on that, you're, you're thinking we need to we need to do more, we, not we, just as a government, but no, as a people. No, as a people, no, mm -hmm. as a as a people, even. I mean, it, going going back to our people, um, we have these. We hosted the Carifta Games. Um, the Football Association hosted a few regional competitions here. Mm -hmm. Um, rugby hosted some international competitions here, and I mean, it is sad to say. I don't know if our people don't get it, if they don't understand, but we don't support anything. Well, well, I'm going to I'm going to jump on my profession <laughs> here <Okay>. for a minute <laughs> and not necessarily jump on them. But I'm, I'm going to say what I normally say to other people. Mm -hmm. This is where I, I absolutely feel disappointed in the media um, and the fact that when it comes to grassroots sports, when it comes to sporting um, competitions, we don't give it much coverage. No. We, we, we don't place much That's importance true. on it as, a, a, as media. Um, and, and I say that if, um, being a trained media professional, I, I, I see and I, and I look in the newspapers, look on television, and I, I go, hmm, we could do a far better job <laughs> if we actually put some effort into it. No, it's true. You know, and I understand, it's, again, it's going to take resources. Yeah, it's going to take resources. you said that, but it is true. No, because it's something I say every single yeah. week, and I go, okay, so why aren't there pictures? I mean, as a, as a, as a parent, why mm. aren't there pictures of my child in right. the newspaper? You know, that's You're what right. I'm going to want. I would no, buy serious. a paper for, for that one most reason. Most would, most would. You know, so. We get a lot of coverage in the paper because... We do the job ourselves. Mm -hmm. We have people taking pictures, and I have someone that write our press releases and send it to the mediums, media, so we're doing your work for you. When, in fact, you should come out because, I mean, I mean it's I not know. only about working, it's an experience. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, I know 
I know um, I know a lot of organizations do that from a sporting perspective. Mm-hmm. They you know do most of the work themselves. And I understand again we have a small again going back to playing devil devil's <laughs> advocate. We have a small media profession uh, uh, you know trade here. <laughs> yeah, we have a, we, so I understand they can't be everywhere and cover everything. Oh, that but is I'm true just too. asking them to to cover a little bit more stuff, you know. Yeah. That, that's all I'm saying. And, and I understand some media houses do it, and they do a pretty good job of it. You know, I don't want to single anybody out. No. And that's why I, I said the media, because I, I want all of us to, to do more. Yeah. Some, some of them do a pretty good job, but we can do more. That's all I'm saying. It, oh, we have a call on the line? Yes. Good afternoon, Damien and Sonia. How are you guys doing? We're Hello, wonderful. Good, How are you? I am doing very well. I just wanted to call in and, um, I guess, totally agree with what you guys are saying in terms of um, the media not doing a good enough job in terms of covering sporting events. Um, I had an event back in January. It was an early morning event, and absolutely no media was there, right? Um, But come a few hours after the event, I was getting texts, I was getting calls, I was getting you know, various messages asking for pictures, asking for, for information. Yes. And I, I mean, I gave it to them simply because it was my event and I wanted to get the, the information out there. But I just kept thinking, um, shouldn't you have been there to cover this event, you yeah. know? And I, I just thought it was because it was an early morning event that, you know, persons maybe didn't want to get up so early. But I am totally in agreement with what you guys are saying, you know, because we do all of the work for them, it seems like, sometimes. Um, but because, you know, once again, it's our event, you want to get the message out, so you do send the pictures, you do send the messages, and so forth. Well, thank you very much, Colin, and we appreciate your comments. And, and I will say that one thing I, I don't understand myself as a media professional, uh, in my training at university, you know, there was never any talk about the media taking a break. <laughs> and, and I always say everybody needs a break sometime, not the entire organization. And this is the only country where I know the entire media goes on break. At yeah. Christmas time, and sad to say, but Christmas is when usually most of the newsworthy stuff happens. Yeah. And so that's just my opinion. If you guys want to take it up with me, you know how to find me. You know, yeah. but I'm just saying that I I I, oh, I find that strange. That's true. But and and I totally agree with her sentiments. I I share the very same sentiments. And sometimes I'm annoyed. Yes. Mm-hmm. But like she said, because it's your event. You feel you have to do it because you want your event published. You want it out there. You want people to know about it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, unfortunately, this is the position that we find ourselves in. Okay. Now, um, just before we wrap this up, I want to ask you from, you know, having those people out there who may be on scholarship and who may be on or, or looking to turn pro, people like Delano, like Billy, um, what role can they play in helping develop sports back here at home? Um, I think they can be ambassadors. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the simple, simplest and um, it's the most gratifying um, thing that I think any professional athlete who feel they've benefited from their country mm-hmm. and wants to make a contribution can do. And when I say ambassador, because I think sometimes when we talk about ambassadors, we get the wrong idea of mm-hmm. being everybody likes to say I'm an ambassador because it sounds really nice, huh? But being an ambassador is not only coming in, um, being invited to events to speak, um, to sign some autographs, take pictures and pose with children, go on the podium, give out medals, and that sort of thing. Um, you, you really, if you want to motivate and encourage athletes, you need to connect with them. Mm-hmm. And connect with them meaning that you, you kind of want to, to bring yourself down to their level mm-hmm. and, and give them access to you. You know, give them your email or your telephone number so they can have access to you to ask you questions and all. When, a, when an athlete is able to, to have that access to someone who they look up to, I mean, that does something to the athlete in itself without even opening your mouth. You know, and then the rest is, is gravy, people well, would say. And they can be very good ambassadors. They're young. I mean, they're, they're, they're well-loved by, 
the athletes here, the children, they're well loved by the community. Um, they can inspire a lot of them by being athletes, but they have to be, it has to be in a way where um, they have real access to them to mm -hmm. make them feel like there's that relationship. Well, my mother always said the most important thing you can give is time because you yes. can't get it back. Access. Mm -hmm. so, so I have one more question before we wrap this up. Where do you see sport development in the Turks and Caicos going in the next 15, 20 years? Good afternoon, Cole. You're on the line. Yes, good afternoon to you all. Sister the bell right here listening. How are you all on the air speaking about the athletes and the football game and all the games and the talks at Caicos Island? And that is very nice of you all putting that out there, you know? And that is very nice, and I love to hear things like that because when we turn and the talks at Caicos Island, I want them to go out there and be just like us. The Lionel Williams to bring on all the girls for the country of the Toxic Cagas Island. Yes, and Sister Bear Brog, each and every one of you all out there. And I love you and I just be praying for you all. And I want you thank all to be praying for Sister Bear too, eh? Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Hello, I don't know when I say see you. Thank and you, I honey. You I love you. Love you. you gotta come look for your honey. Yes, honey. Yeah. I'm <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you. you love you too. You know, we yeah. got to. All right. You take care now. All right. Well, also, my last question. Where do you see sport going in? Thank you, Ms. Bab. You know I love you. Where do you see sport going in the next 15 to 20 years? Hmm. Where do I see us going? First, I think if, you know, we, we, take it serious and when I say we mm -hmm. again it's a collective effort mm -hmm. between the government the national governing bodies the parents the athlete if we take it serious um, government puts sports on the agenda I see a lovely budget passed the other day I I'm not impressed with numbers when I see it I'm more impressed it's only a proposal um, yes <laughs> um, I'm, I'm more impressed with action mm -hmm. you know and, and um, you know, not, not knocking the government or anything because I, I, they, they probably have their mind in the right direction, but um, there hasn't been a whole lot happening mm -hmm. in sports from the government standpoint for me to feel that impressed about. I think if we, we take it very serious, in the next 10, 15 years, we can see athletes Mm. on the world stage, more professional athletes receiving more medals, flying the Turks and Caicos flag, not only in the region, throughout the world, coming home, being great ambassadors. I can see great administrators coming out of our programs, um, people holding positions similar mm. to mine from their national association because those opportunities are there. Mm -hmm. They're there for all of us. I mean, who would have thought, I would have never dreamt that a little Grand Turk girl, you know, from a country with a population of 30 plus thousand people would have been sitting on a FIFA executive committee. I never dreamt it, and I'm sure most of those people on the FIFA executive committee are still scratching their head now wondering why am I there. Mm -hmm. But. I said that to say those opportunities are there. If we take sports serious, we have to take it seriously. I can't say that I will see us in the next 10 to 15 years um, winning gold medals, um, mm -hmm. making the Olympics if we ever get there, and that sort of thing, unless we take it serious. We have to take sports as our business. We have to work towards it. We have to invest in it. We have to support it. And when I say support it, I'm talking about the government. The, the people of the country, I'm talking about each and every one of us. And if we do that, we'll be flying this Turks and Caicos flag very high on an international level. Sonia, I want to thank you for coming. I want to thank you for you know, speaking those sentiments. And of course, I want to echo the same. If we, if we take sports seriously, yes. there's no limit to what we can None do. None whatsoever. And Turks and Caicos, I want to leave you with that. And I want to say from each and every one of us, uh, you know, have a happy, safe, and enjoyable Easter holiday. God bless you guys. And thank you so much for having me. All right. <laughs>